Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in and welcome back to the Games Forum online webinar series um, with Storm Maven. Um, my name is John Speakman from Games Forum. Today's episode, we're talking contextual advertising um, and about building an audience rather than identifying a user. So, um, delighted to welcome for the very first time actually Abhishek Sen, from, who is CEO with Number 8, um, and Jonathan Fishman, VP of Marketing with Storm Maven. Um, don't forget, viewers, you can get involved, join the conversation with fellow attendees using the chat box to the right of the screen. Um, so as usual, let's uh, start with some introductions. Um, Abby, if you want to tell us a bit about yourself um, and number eight. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks for the intro, John. And, and good to meet you, Jonathan. Uh, um, yes, we, were, we had attended a Games Forum conference a couple of months ago, which we thoroughly enjoyed. So it's great to speak with John here again. Just to uh, clarify, I terribly enjoyed viewers. Not yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just want to emphasize. I mean, John did pay me separately, so that's a <laughs> you got on the side, yeah. But uh, yeah, great to be here and to talk about something that we've uh, a topic that we found is causing quite a bit of confusion in the marketplace right now in terms of what is this contextual thing and when you have brands and advertisers and marketeers trying to understand how do we define it and that's clouded by the fact that. There's web and there's mobile, there's in-app and all these different terminologies. So we face quite a bit of challenge in terms of understanding and crystallizing what is it that we're trying to do over here. And so as a bit of a background, as John mentioned, I'm Abhi, uh, Abhishek, co-founder and CEO of Number 8. We're a mobile on-device contextual provider. And we typically work, we're an in-app only solution where today we leverage sensor data from mobile devices to then translate these raw sensors that happen completely on the device without relying on any PII information and convert it to saying things like, let's say Jonathan is commuting right now, or you're relaxing, or you're working at gym. These are in-moment pieces of context that we can actually deliver. And on the basis of that, on these habits, we can actually translate them into audiences, just I'm a jogger, frequent shopper, or a workaholic, and so on and so forth. These audiences can be built up on the basis of what I'm doing in the moment. And that's what we actually do with our publisher partners or even our SSP partners who we engage with directly. Perfect. Yeah. And we're absolutely going to dive into that entire journey. So looking forward to it. Um, Jonathan, a bit about yourself and, and your role at and Stormhaven. Sure. So I'm uh, Jonathan Fishman. I'm a VP Marketing at Stormhaven. I have been with uh, the company for about five years. So um, and the mobile marketing industry. So I've, I've been through a lot, a lot of changes. Uh, recently, there have been a lot. Um, a bit about Stormhaven. We are uh, we started our, our journey as an uh, A/B testing platform for product pages on the App Store and Google Play. And today, we are leaders in in app store optimization and in mobile growth. And we've developed a platform that help marketers and uh, UA folks basically understand their audiences, identify their top funnel opportunities, where they're valuable users are actually coming from and then um, basically tackle that with uh, different product pages on the app store. So actually designing them with context in mind uh, um, and uh, optimize them through testing. So uh, we both support testing for product pages through the store maven platform who relies on replicated app store pages. And we support uh, the, the the new features that the app store has been releasing over the, na the last few weeks, which are in-app events and custom product pages. And mm -hmm. we allow native testing as well. And we've, we, we also have a data platform that allows you to monitor the performance on, of each and every funnel, measure the impact of your mobile marketing uh, efforts, and then uh, report on that. So uh, that's uh, Storm Event in a nutshell. And I'm really excited to talk about contextual marketing. I've been uh, speaking about this topic a lot over the past few weeks. Um, we, we did our own conference uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and contextual was a big topic that got a lot of people interested about. So I'm excited uh, to dive into that. Yeah, and absolutely, like you both mentioned, you know, it's, um, you know, for, for advertisers, a real kind of area of interest. And also, it's raising a lot of questions. So I think um, very kind of, let's start kind of right at the beginning, really. What What is contextual and what do each of you actually understand by it? So I think that's a, a really interesting discussion point as well. So, Abby, can, you know, you've mentioned, obviously, kind of on-device signals. How do you and number eight think about contextual at this point? 
Sure. Actually, we were in the, on that topic, we were having a discussion with IAB UK here in terms of defining what does context mean? Because IAB UK, as any industry body, you're looking at defining context for all the members. You're talking about web members, in-app members, and you're going to have CTV at some point in time. So let's, let's cover this with the umbrella that this is, we're talking about in-app mobile, not web, not CTV. So the way you would understand in-app context is, you know, it's like when an ad is being targeted based on non-PII based data. And that can be based on the user level information, device level information. So we internally, how we actually look at it, and as you're actually engaging with a lot of taxonomy providers, we have about five or six different categories on how we define in-app context. So you have things like app level information, so this app category or the app version ranking, things that you are publicly able to get. <laughs> then you have user level information, such as session length, number of interaction that you get then you'll have device level information saying things like battery status, device storage, et cetera. To if you keep diving in further, you have sensor level information that is raw sensor data. You have GPS location, you have accelerometer data, so on. And then you start going higher level into content level interactions, just saying, oh, I'm listening to, you know, I'm playing at this level of a game. I'm listening to this type of a music, um, you know, music playlist, that's content interactions. And finally, you have live context. What is happening in the user's life when they're engaging with an app? So they're you know, using it when they're on the bus, they're at home, they're working at the gym. So we've come up with about six different categories, six different layers of peeling and unraveling. What is context? Mm -hmm. And then you can see which one is, makes most sense, which one makes sense. Again, it has to make sense. When Jonathan, you're going, to do, you're going to pick into understanding what does it make sense from an advertiser point of view? Because at the end of the day, someone's got to be actually make use of this data to give something relevant. So that's our understanding of context in six different levels we peeled on in of sorts. Okay. Jonathan, how do um, Storm even think about context and contextual advertising? So we think about it from, um, I like to call it, I don't like to call it traditional marketing or old fashioned marketing. Some people are, are referring to that these days, but uh, I just want to take a step back and understand what happened in the mobile industry in the past few years. Mm -hmm. I mean, the kind of growth that uh, different games and apps experienced was driven by user level data, user level data that was uh, obtained without user consent by different ad networks. I would say Facebook was uh, the leading one um, and the, leverage that to profile basically the entire world and create a user graph which has insane amount of data um, including what you did uh, in each and every app that, that you have Facebook was reported all this data back from these apps uh, used it to build a, um, th that user graph and then they were extremely efficient in uh, serving ads to very targeted audiences what was known as lookalike audiences um, that is not coming back. And I don't think that contextual um, advertising or contextual marketing has even the ability to um, be that good in targeting because it's kind of unfair. I mean, the, the past few years were unfair. Of course, that if you serve an ad to somebody who just made an in-app purchase in a match three game with an ad for a uh, new match three game, that in the ad creative, it says um, en enjoying uh, this and that, you might enjoy this game as well. Of course, it'll work. Um, but... When, you, when Apple basically started to uh, enforce the, the deprecation of the IDFA, they uh, kind of sent the, the industry into mayhem and, and really hurt Facebook and, and different ad networks. Uh, eventually, uh, the use of user level data will go away. Today, there are some uh, parties that are still using it, uh, but I think Apple is going to enforce it uh, very soon. And contextual marketing is basically not something new. It's what happened before. It's basically answering the question from a marketing perspective of uh, who, my, who are my users? I mean, who are these audiences? Mm. I mean, trying to imagine these people and what actually drives them to action. Um, and then trying to find them where, where in, they're in the perfect state of mind or the perfect context to actually respond to, to an ad or to any marketing offer. So when I think about contextual, even search ads is the most contextual thing ever because somebody is just searching for something and you're hitting them with an ad about that thing that they search. Google has been doing that with uh, AdWords for years. So that, that's the way we think about contextual marketing is basically asking yourself, who are my audiences or my top audience? 
audiences and uh, a Twitch context, can I meet them to actually drive them to install my app? Uh, and one of, uh, and, and there's a lot of different components to context. Uh, Abby, you mentioned a lot. I, we think that one of the most uh, effective ones that can be layered on, on top of that is which app or games that you, uh, user is, is using right now when they see the ad. Uh, not just in terms of like the broad category they're playing a puzzle game, but uh, understanding um, really the type of player they are and what motivates them to play games in the first place. There's a certain type of uh, motivation that uh, lies behind why somebody would play uh, a hidden object game. And then uh, by analyzing your your acquisition sources by sub-publisher and, and categorizing them by these contextual buckets, you can really understand the motivations of these audiences and then build a holistic funnel uh, with with your app store product pages and serving that to that audience on those apps. So that's how we think about contextual. Interesting. So it's, it almost sounds like kind of from, from with viewing it from two angles here, kind of identifying the audience and then understanding the audience. And, and that's kind of creating a, a mm-hmm. more general kind of contextual picture. So um, is that fair to say? Or, or Yeah, I think it's, it's basically where they are, why are they there and, and what are they doing exactly when they uh, when they're doing whatever they're doing so it's uh, I agree with you all that does of you know serving the right content the right moment the right time and to the right audience obviously so that's all that does you've been hearing and you know if you given any kind of marketing format that is still the most succinct way of saying it right right content right audience right moment so context will definitely allow you to answer the audience piece, the right audience, and also the right moment. The right creative, too, you can say, you know, the right creative can also be tailored, as mm-hmm. I think we'll probably tap into how do you have the right creative that you can, that'll be, you know, most receptive to an audience listening to or watching the page, et cetera. So, okay. yeah. So, I mean, on, on number, you know, just kind of dive into a bit about number eight. Can you tell us about how that works, how, how you kind of build your contextual audience um, for, the, for your partners? Sure. Uh, what's been interesting is that because uh, of the changes that uh, Jonathan mentioned, you know, in terms of what's actually happened in the mobile ecosystem, there's reliance on identifiers from the beginning of mobile advertising or web advertising as well. I mean, we'll just talk about in-app. This, I, this reliance on identifiers has been very prevalent as in the cornerstone of, you know, it has been the cornerstone of advertising to deliver any kind of relevant messaging. Right. Now, we looked at it slightly differently because we didn't come from an advertising space. The solution that we developed was to basically do, you know, to leverage the power of what a, a device has to deliver personalized content. That content being music, radio, podcasts, news, and ads comes under content as well. So when we actually, what we actually do is, you know, we tap into a whole range of sensors in our smartphones today. So I think, uh, you know, you have accelerometers, gyroscope, compass, brightness, location, all these things that are present on our devices today that has no connection to John as an individual or Abby as an individual. It's just the app has these sensors. It has to can tap into these. And then what we do is that we are able to combine them intelligently on the device itself without sending any raw data off the device. To then understand these patterns that are happening in the user's journey and when they're using the app live in the moment. So, you know what? Um, um, the device is in my hand. I'm sitting down um, indoors um, at a hotel and so on and so forth. Right. And then as we start, let's say we start playing this game more and more, or we start using this app more and more, we start building habits as we do as, you know, as consumers, as app players, etc. We start building these habits because, okay, if I keep using this, uh, if I keep playing this game on the bus every day, Guess what? I'm a frequent commuter on a bus. That's just the nature of it. And then all of a sudden, these audiences can be traded programmatically or through direct deals or uh, on the, yeah, they can be traded. And that's how we're working today. So these signals can actually then maybe pass for the buy side of the market to tap into to build relevant campaigns on the back off. That's how we actually deliver these. And they're completely idealist. They don't rely on any identifier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, nice. so, sorry, Jonathan, go on. No, just, it's, it's really nice. I just had a question whether you're uh, also trying to bucket, I mean, you're trying to bucket people according to, I don't know, computer, commuters or people that are into, uh, I, I say, sports or 
also by I don't know the, the certain types of players or certain type of uh, yeah. So we look at it from so we we won't go on an in depth level of let's say specific game level level because you won't have access to that. But we look at okay, we have an area where we're looking at different types of apps have these kinds of audiences. For example, when uh, mm -hmm. I audience, it's if you look at IAB audience taxonomy, uh, we're matching it to that. And we are we have quite a bit of crossover into those audience taxonomies and IV audience taxonomy 2.0. Uh, I think that's what we're working on the back of. That's what they will use. That's what a buyer will end up using to target. Okay, this is the cohort or the audience I'm, I want to tap into. Because one problem that we've had again, we looked at it from if you look at performance advertising and brand advertising. Brand advertising in games, it's an up and coming area where there's a lot of interest of what is the opportunity for that. And brand advertising, as you can understand, you know, brands typically know who their audience is, know who their consumers are. Nike knows who's going to buy their shoes. But for them to understand and buy into these, you know, to, for them to sell a new pair of sneakers, they need to see who are joggers or shoppers, et cetera. But they can trade on the basis of battery power. It, it, it doesn't add up. You know, they're not speaking the same language at that point. So that's where this behavioral piece becomes very valuable from brand advertising point of view. From a performance point of view, what's very powerful is that is that thing that you touched on, Jonathan, is when is a consumer, when is an app owner, uh, when, when is a user most receptive to download and use and install a specific type of a game? What's the moment? You can have the exact same user. When they wake up in the morning, they're leaving and then they rush to go to work. That's not the right time. The exact same user, when they come back home, they have had a you know, stressful day at work. That's probably the most likely time it, it it's just a contact it's not the, the user is the same it's still happy the same user hmm. but the moment is very yeah, different i i i, re I really like that because it's because first of all you have i mean i'm also looking at it from the perspective of the kind of work marketers and ua folks have to do now and and it actually started like the most forward-thinking brands that i know start thinking in in terms of funnels and audiences and contextual yeah. marketing and advertising But the kind of work they need to do is, first of all, understand where these people are, who are these people, and, and then also adding that layer of, of uh, data that you mentioned and serving them um, the offer, the ad, whatever it is, at the right moment uh, when they're receptive to it. And that's uh, that kind of work, They it's something they... Ne didn't need to do for years. I mean, oh, the, the, all of them had access. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they had these machines available to all of them. It's, it's uh, you know, growth machines like Facebook. You just gave a dollar to Facebook. They gave you two. It's, it was kind of unfair. And you didn't have any idea who, who are these people. Like a lookalike audience. I could put a hundred marketers uh, in a room and ask them, who were your lookalike audiences like which people i mean can you imagine these people you can imagine these personas and probably they can they couldn't and now they need to go back to kind of first grade in a good way and start learning about their audiences who they are where they're spending their time and then thinking about the right messaging um well, so. well they have this process called kyc right know your customer it's kind of like the kyc mindset yeah. in the mobile world it's all right what is your kyc do you know Who is your customer? Who is your user? Where are they coming from? What type of messaging is going to resonate the most? As opposed to relying on a third party to do that work for you entirely, you have that. And that's, I think the first party data combination flows quite well into that as well, because it's almost empowering publishers to say, hey, this is, or an advertiser, can you tap into your first party? You have an audience. Can you tap into that to really understand and expand on that existing audience? Because as you mentioned on Facebook, you know, Facebook audience and any kind of audience network that was built on the premise of identifiers to find lookalikes, that's fundamentally broken today. And that will, it's not something that's going to be resolved with more identifiers. No, that's not the whole point. The point is that how do you move away from identifiers while still delivering value to both users, publishers, and also marketers? Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Okay, so then Jonathan, how, how to stop, so kind of moving towards the audience thing, how are you learning about audiences um, You know, you mentioned earlier, kind of still maybe using ML. Like, what are your kind of how are you widening advertisers' understanding of their target audiences and moving them away from that kind of um, ID-driven user experience? Sure. So, 
um, in, in the same uh, lines of basically understanding uh, who are these people, who are these audiences, we believe that uh, you can group different sources of, of uh, users coming into your app in different contextual buckets, if you would. So if you think about um, your referral traffic coming into the app store, you can break it down by sub-publisher. And Apple uh, is also doing a lot of things in these areas. They're, they're making a lot of progress in making uh, the data they provide through App Store Connect, that first party data about the App Store, um, to, to, to become a really good source of truth of what's really going on. Um, they, they add new metrics. Just recently, they added the re-downloads and first time uh, installs. So for the first time, you can actually understand total installs, which is kind of nuts because it wasn't the case up until now. Um, and when you look at your referral traffic on App Store Connect, uh, you have the data there, each and every sub-publisher to drive users to your app. And you can see the entire funnel, the conversion rate for, for these users, sales coming in from these uh, users, and even uh, retention data, um, uh, average proceedings per user. There's a lot of data there on a sub-publisher level. Now, on its own doesn't mean a lot, and and it's uh, you have thousands and thousands of sub publishers, so it's the manual work there is is impossible. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you build a really intelligent machine to group these sub publishers by context, and I'm not talking just about categories in the app store, because then you see basically that 90% are coming from casual games and it won't mean a lot. But if you actually break it down to really granular level of uh, of a taxonomy, basically, of which types of, of games and apps are they, uh, endless runners, hidden object, uh, home decoration, stuff like that, you can really start to define uh, patterns and see these uh, patterns in, in the data um, and build these type of funnels. So, for example, a home decoration funnel that, are ma that is made up from all the sub-publishers that are sending traffic to the app store, to your product page, from these type of, of games and then treat it as a funnel. Once you do that, uh, and, and we do this automatically through our platform, you, base, you can basically really easily identify your top op opportunities in terms of uh, first time installs and, and downloads and, and re-downloads and, and also in terms of sales and revenues, which is the most important uh, thing. Um, and, and then of course you can complete the picture by creating a holistic funnel, sending that traffic to a custom product page. The, the custom product pages are um, are somewhat out to some developers. They're rolling out as we speak, um, but uh, you can really easily uh, make sure that the ads that you serve in these uh, these apps and games, these sub publishers, are going to a custom product page that speak that language and talks yeah. about the, the core motivation that makes that audience want to install. And by doing that work. Um, we believe you can kind of recreate what lookalikes was. Uh, you can create a kind of a sub-publisher lookalike. Like mm -hmm. this funnel brings me a lot of really valuable users. They're coming from home decoration games. Uh, I wonder which other types of, of contexts uh, have a high affinity to my game and, and would also bring me, also bring me a, lot of, uh, a lot of value in terms of revenues and then installs. Uh, and we also do that. We find connections and patterns uh, around the, across the entire industry. And, and we, we know that the affinity between different contexts. And then you can uh, basically expand your audience similar to how you used to expand lookalike audiences from 1% to 2% to 5% of uh, the population. So uh, that's how we solve it at Stormy. I have a couple of questions actually. So on that, uh, Jonathan, you know, you touched on a couple of things that's very important in today's space. One is the almost a redefinition of how lookalikes are actually built, the whole lookalike modeling. Because mm -hmm. what you're talking about is almost redefining that lookalike modeling piece using contextual information. Because, you know, as you talked about, you know, lookalikes have traditionally been built around, okay, I need to know Jonathan's ID. And so I'll go find a whole bunch of other IDs that look like Jonathan so I can find that. So that's very interesting. The second thing was, I wanted to understand because you have, you know, you have the app store on iOS and then you have the Android play store. How do you mm -hmm. see the advertiser reception or, or advertiser understanding of these differences in these app store capabilities when they go to advertise on iOS and Android, because, you know, they're quite different in the way that, you know, what these app stores actually, you know, what kind of capabilities they offer. What is the level of education and understanding that you've seen from advertisers when they try to plan, you know, 
you know, build campaigns on, on these two. And especially in these recent months that things have evolved quite, dra- quite drastically. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that, um, again, the, the smartest folks out there are already doing this and investing a lot of time and efforts into developing these, uh, these new muscles. Um, th- there wasn't a lot of companies that relied on, on the console data, um, you know, in the past two years. Uh, they, they used to live in their MMP dashboards that relied on, um, you know, on deterministic attribution and and really a, kind of accurate uh, return on ad spend, that's where they lived. Uh, so they kind of neglected the consoles as a as a, an important data source. There's also Apple and Google to blame for that because it was really underdeveloped for years. Um, only in 2017, I believe, Apple started to actually break down the sources of traffic you get to, to your product page or to your app listing on on the store. And Google wasn't. Uh, uh, very, uh, you know, wasn't a lot better. Uh, in the past few years, both of them evolved uh, the consoles a lot, and and I think it's becoming um, uh, more of like of a consensus that you should look at this data because it's the only source of truth for um, it downloads. And and when you think, and it actually connects to broader marketing topics like app store optimization, uh, but that's the data that the con the the stores themselves use when they think of which app should I promote across the store in featuring in the top charts and so on. So it's becoming more of an important data source and, and companies are leveraging that. Uh, the two are very different in terms of the data they, they provide. Um, and uh, the Google Play Store, they're also on the Android ecosystem, they, they still didn't adopt the same harsh privacy guidelines that Apple have adopted. So uh, a lot of the spend has moved there to uh, basically make up for what they lost in iOS. But I think that eventually in the long term, both stores would be uh, uh, very similar in terms of like the ban on using identifiers for targeting. Yeah. So, Abby, I want to kind of learn, look at kind of number eight a bit more and understand what you kind of understand why chaos, because we've touched on kind of the way that you kind of interpret signals to build out an audience, but then... How is this then applied and having an advertisers then apply um, once you've kind of built out uh, the cohorts and, 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 and in the same way kind of Jonathan has with, with lookalike audiences from, from Stormwave? Yeah. Point of view. So from a cohort's point of view, right? So uh, the way we would operate is basically trying to, you know, recreating some something in this ecosystem, as you all know, is really hard. <laughs> you know, you're going to, oh, this is a new mechanism we're going to bring out. You have to all adopt it let's not go down that route because it's very hard to get people to change something new. New equals risk usually. So what we are like to do, we're doing right now is working with the standards body. So be die, be taxonomy groups or working groups, uh, specification groups to essentially standardize a lot of these buys that are happening. And that would be working with the organizers tech lab to pre-bid and so on and so forth to make it easier for buyers to buy into contextual targeting, uh, to buy into you know, to, yeah, to make it easier for them to buy the contextual options. And how we would do that is we basically pass this information into the bid stream itself. So the same way you would be passing on IP address and geo information, you'd be sending it as either, um, you know, open RTB objects that would be sent over the same way that you would have these. And they would then be, bid, you know, you'd be bidding on these on the DSP side of things as they become part of your regular uh, DSP planning tools. That's how they will be facilitated and activated mm. campaign point of view. And then that allows you to then build specific, you know, multiple campaigns as you were touching to, you know, Jonathan in terms of A-B testing. You can really slice and dice a whole bunch of campaigns in parallel to say, all right, I want to test this specific geo with these kinds of se- segments that I'm tapping into, or I want to hit this campaign over the weekend or in the evenings because I know that they'll be most receptive to yeah. the download message right now. And that's how we are actually bring it out again to minimize the point of friction from an adoption point of view. And that's how we, so we are partnering with soon. Our customers will be in the world of digital audio, mobile gaming, and also SSPs because that's ones. So those are the players who are essentially serving the ads themselves. So we integrate there. Amazing. And, and I think to add to that, you, you talked about, um, you know, making sure that these audiences are receptive to to the, to the offer, to the ad, to the messaging, and, and the creative. 
Um, I think that's another skill that are that is now being uh, rebuilt. Uh, it's it's folks yeah. that did mobile, uh, folks that did web marketing have been doing this, uh, uh, you know, for years and years yeah. and, and for a very long time. But people in mobile, because these machines existed, that Facebook targeting machine and the different ad networks, uh, all the self attributing networks, basically. Um, they kind of, the, the skill kind of atrophied because uh, mm-hmm. they, it was that machine that decided which ad and which message would, would be the most suited for each and every person. And you didn't know why they're doing that. Uh, and also because the, the targeting was that specific, the creative was less important in terms of convincing and influencing that user to actually um, install that ad. It wasn't about discovering the core motivation of what makes that user play that game uh, and it didn't have a lot of convincing to do because it you found the right person at the right moment and you didn't know how but mm-hmm. Facebook knew and and today they need to do a lot of testing all all the marketing and UA teams uh, to actually understand or rediscover basically what is motivating um, these different audiences to install and in terms of the moments I mean being um, I, I assume there is a different marketing message that would work best when you're back from work from a stress day uh, for that same person than the messaging that would work for that, that user when they're, uh, I don't know, uh, riding the bus on, on the way to work at the Absolutely. same morning. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's a piece on, you know, you have the DC of your dynamic creative optimization, as they call it, you know, as you, the same creative, same campaign, but as multiple, you know, I mean, look at any, I'm, uh, I'm going to use Nike again. It's not like I'm getting paid by Nike, but I keep using Nike as an example. You know, you, you're trying to sell a new pair of sneakers, but then they already have identified different cohorts of audiences. So they'll have the same shoes, but in different light and settings and environments. Why is that happening? As an element of personalization. And when is the user going to be most receptive? When is the context that they're in? And then they feel they can identify with it. You know, I need to identify with the message. All right, how am I going to be identified? Well, they know a little bit about me. So then I'll be, oh, yeah, I, you know, it makes sense. Okay, I'll download it. I'll, I'll click on it and I'll use it. So that's becoming very, actually, that will be very powerful going forward. Being able to really think from the consumer point of view or the user point of view into understanding what will it be, what will make them most receptive to download it. Mm-hmm. One is the moment, of course, when are they going to be? And then it's like, what kind of messaging, uh, you know, will actually resonate with them? So, yeah, that's yeah. very powerful. It's yeah, and, and, and space, cause, there's, another yeah. Part, there's another piece to that, which is, uh, I would say, custom product pages on, on iOS 15. Yeah. They bring for the first time the ability to kind of, in a clean way, uh, measure that if, if you actually build it in a certain way and configure it in a way that a specific audience really defined in terms of the moments they're in, the, the context they're in, the, the app they're coming from. Uh, if you send them to through a custom URL to that custom product page, uh, then, then within App Store Connect, you'll have the data of how that performed in terms of sales, retention, average proceedings per users. You have a lot of downstream metrics there that are aggregated. They're not user level, but they will allow you to measure the performance of changes, for example, in that messaging. So uh, that's also pretty cool. You know, that makes a lot of sense because you have, you can think of dynamic creative at multiple levels, right? First is what will get someone to click on it. Then they'll go to the store and then they still have to go, you know, they haven't completed the process yet. They still have to download it. So that's yeah. the first level of that itself. That's first level of creative optimization. Second level is the, the product pages. What will be most receptive? You know, how will this specific user be most receptive to that product pages, for example? Maybe even shuffling the orders of, you know, you might you might just have two versions. You just swap the orders and mm-hmm. switch one choice first before they have to swipe to see the rest of the carousel. Yeah, but, and, and yeah. I think that eventually... Uh, ah, sorry, you were breaking up for a bit. Um, I think that, that eventually the industry will rebuild uh, another machine, which is just going to be a machine that is based on aggregate data and not user level data. And uh, and it would still work dynamically and automatically and will continue to allow, uh, um, you know, publishers and developers to, to grow. Um, as you said, there's so many opportunities to, uh, to dynamically optimize all of these funnels in real time in terms of 
even changing the messaging from morning to the afternoon to the night, um, different weekdays and weekends mm-hmm. and all that happening automatically. And, and our vision in Stormhaven is uh, really fits into that. We, we want to be a big part of, of that from the app store side of things. Do you reckon it's, you know, I would have imagined, you know, this is one brain noise because you have the attribution players who, mm-hmm. you know, who are, who would have to figure out, okay, how in this post identity world, how they actually operate. And then there's on the back of that, you start, start seeing, all right, this dynamic creative piece where, you know, Storm Maven and other, you know, you basically say, all right, how can we actually, okay, it's just happened. How can we move on from here? Do you see attribution players evolving into dynamic creative? Because, you know, like Vungo, for example, they already really push on the creative side of things. Uh, I think they have, you know, creative ads. Um, do you see attribution players evolving into that space where they'll do creative dynamics or sorry, creative assets to basically give insights to advertisers? Or do you see that being an independent piece that, you know, that be a whole new business on its own as contextual becomes more and more prevalent? I, I do think it's a different business. Business. Um, I'm saying that because just I had the privilege to work with Storin for the past five years, okay. and I know how much expertise does it require to really understand and optimize creatives in the right way, and how much uh, and what type of skill sets it requires. It's completely different than the type of uh, companies that the that the MPs um, founders have built in in the past uh, decade or so. Um, from looking at the industry, there's a lot of M&A activity. There's basically one significant MMP that's that's left independent. Um, um, yeah, I won't say any names, uh, but it's pretty clear. And uh, and I think there's that, that it's not going to come from the MMP side. Uh, it's going to come from, uh, as you said, Van Gogh, uh, AppLav, and Iron Source. These are the the major ad networks will become one-stop shops eventually. And, and I can see them trying to build this either, uh, I, I think inorganically is more uh, of, a, of a feasible way to, to build that capability uh, within their one-stop shops. But I do see them going more and more into creatives and um, using that to build these growth machines of the future. Yeah. Um, but, but it's a completely different skill set to, to basically understand creatives and it's not hard to develop so it's it's not just a matter of how many resources you can throw at that problem. You, you need to you know, have that extra. Today, when you do the at multiple product pages, is there some kind of education that you have to do for advertisers today to basically have their teams build up these multiple creators? So, and because that's a new new process for them as well, right? And so they because they have to you know either it's going to be an in house activity at the advertiser side. Or there's going to be creative agencies who basically take on this work or basically companies like Stormwave. You have an in-house creative agency department that works with advertisers back and forth. What's What's been, you know, like what have you seen so far in your experience? So it's a really good question. I think um, when I think about it uh, deeply, a lot of them, I mean, uh, pretty much every you know, serious app marketer or UA person have done testing pretty extensively over, let's say, the past five, six, seven years. Um, they tested their product, they had one product page per country, but they tested it pretty uh, significantly and they extracted from that a ton of insights about how different audiences respond to different messaging. They had to choose one. At the end of the day, they had either, uh, they had basically... Uh, a requirement to choose which audience I want to optimize for. They had to choose if I'm a dating app, I'm Bumble, for example, I had to choose. Do, do I want to have a messaging, the right messaging for men or women? Or uh, another option would be to aim for the lowest common denominator and basically have something that w- works somewhat good for all audiences, but it's not like perfect for a specific audience. Mm. So a lot of these marketers already have these insights. They know which type of messaging work best for uh, their top audiences. They usually know uh, the personas they're aiming for. Um, And now they have a pretty significant challenge, which is taking these insights and uh, 
translating it to multiple product pages and the creative work that, that, that it's kind of an operational hell. You need to uh, increase your creative design resources in-house or tap into an external design uh, studio. We, we actually uh, open up our uh, a service to our design shop, basically to work with these brands and design product pages uh, right. pretty recently. Uh, some of them are really hiring very aggressively uh, more design resources in-house, but everybody understands they need, need uh, to increase their, their resources and design wise to tap into that opportunity. And the opportunity is clear because they, they saw it for themselves. I mean, yeah, kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the kind of uh, dating uh, example I gave, I mean, the difference in conversion rate on the product page can be, you know, high double, high double digits uh, between uh, the right messaging for men and women. And now they can actually tap into both of these at the same time. So uh, they, they have a good reason to invest in more uh, design resources. Yeah. One of the few apps I've seen, I don't know, like during the pandemic, Clubhouse obviously gained a lot of popularity. It's one of the few apps that I still think they keep changing the app logo every second month. I'm like, wait, which app? Oh, there's Clubhouse, of course, because the app logo changes every second month. It's, it's one of the few apps that I know that I've actually done that. And yeah, again, yeah. yeah it's, it takes you away from the app logo that is usually, a, you know, like the logo of the company to just a different logo every single, you know, every single app release. Yeah, I think uh, they didn't test with us, that's for sure. So <laughs> do not, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I can't comment on that, but uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure it was tested. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, um, I think we're very much nearly out of time, but um, I had one final question, but you guys have kind of covered a lot of kind of content there. And what I would like to say is, if viewers do want to get in touch with either of you, you happy to kind of, you know, how should they reach out? So I think there's a, there's a lot of conversations going on right now and both of you seem very much on the pulse. So Jonathan, if um, viewers want to get in touch? Sure, LinkedIn, I think, is the best way. I'm always on LinkedIn, so I'm pretty responsive there. So that would be the best way to message me personally. If you want to learn more about our platform and uh, see it in action, it's it's currently live, so you can actually go to stormhaven.com, uh, hit uh, the demo button, and somebody will be in touch with you pretty fast. Yeah. And Abby, if people want to learn about number eights, work. yeah, um, absolutely. You know, you can either reach me on LinkedIn as well, Abhishek and well, Abhishek Sen, and or you can send me an email directly if you want. Abhishek at I'll, I'll give John. I don't know if you want the email. Abhishek at number eight AI. And as we go forward, we uh, you know we'll see what kind of customers or how we actually bring this to market. Especially, there's a lot of education that is happening right now with this whole on-device piece and privacy piece and context. Peace. So yeah, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn, uh, email, or just go to the website number eight AI. Perfect. So it's a really exciting space. Kind of the idea of just building an audience journey. There's so much opportunity yeah. compared to what we've kind of worked with in the past. Um, cool. Well, gents, thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to kind of listening in on hearing both your views. It's been fascinating. Thanks very much, thank and viewers. Of course, absolute pleasure welcoming you back to the Games Forum webinar series. Really appreciate your time as always. Um, for myself, have a great day. Um, Abby, Jonathan, thanks very much.